Good morning, everyone. It's appropriate we sing about those, those days where we are more mindful of the kingdom of God and dwelling in it forever. As we come to Daniel chapter 2, the rock is here to stay. I'd like to begin by going back to a different age before texting and smartphones. So this is a scenario that wouldn't exist today, but it could have existed back in the day. This is from author David Cook. It's about an undergraduate who's writing back home at the end of a semester while he's far away at college. Here's what the letter had to say. I know you haven't heard much from me in recent months, but the fact is that a few weeks back, there was a fire in the flat and I lost all my possessions. In fact, I only escaped with my life by jumping out of a second story window. Unfortunately, I broke my leg. And I ended up in the hospital overnight. Amazingly, I met the most wonderful nurse there. We immediately fell in love and well, Mom and Dad, to cut a long story short, last Saturday we got married. Our friends say that this was too hasty, but I'm resolved that our love will more than compensate for the vast difference between our age, race, and religious backgrounds. By this point, Mom and Dad, I suspect you may be quite alarmed. So let me tell you straight away that everything I've written in this letter up to this point is completely false. I made it up. The truth is, two weeks ago, I failed all my exams. I just wanted you to have the proper perspective. <laughs> well, when we come to Daniel chapter 2, a proper perspective on the misfortunes that the Jews exiled in Babylon had was desperately needed. They had suffered humiliation, divine judgment, the complete dashing to pieces of all of their life ambitions, and they might have been even tempted to ask, where was God in the midst of all of the travails that they were experiencing? Or if he was even powerful enough to do anything about it. It would have been all too easy for the exiles to lapse into disillusionment. Everybody seemed to let them down. Their government, their armies, even their religion, and even themselves and their own idolatrous choices. You ever feel that way? You think back about some of the choices that you've made? Choices where you've ignored God or deliberately rebelled against his will? What hope can there be in such a state as that? Well, if that's how you feel, then maybe this morning's text will be particularly helpful to you. Daniel was giving the exiles in Babylon a theological interpretation of their experience. And as we saw last week, he was providing a model for how to practice and live out biblical faith in the midst of a pagan world much like our own. I think that sometimes we could all use a similar reorientation of our perspectives as well. Well, as we come to the text, and I do want to encourage you to open up a Bible to Daniel 2, we cannot take time to read 55 verses today, so I would like you to um, read that on your own. I just made up that number. Is it 55 verses in chapter 2, or is it 49? 49. I don't know where I got 55 from. Hoping for the Chargers to score that much today, I guess. I don't know. But as we come to the text, I want you to note there is a fascinating tr uh, transition that takes place. Uh, we probably lose this in the English a little bit, so I want you to be aware of this. Did you know that in Daniel chapter 1, it's all in Hebrew? Daniel's chapter 8 all the way to the end is in Hebrew, but between chapters 2 and 7, it's in the Aramaic. That's fascinating. We don't have any other book like that in the Old Testament in its original language that would shift from one language to the other. That little inset there, chapters 2 through 7, actually have a fascinating structure to it, which we call chiastic. You don't need to remember that. It's like a sandwich where you have bread on the outside, stuff in between, and then the meat in the middle, right? And that's kind of what's going on between chapters 2 and 7. The entire section is 
the bread, sandwiched around an interpretation of a parallel dream about four parts representing four kingdoms. You'll see that in chapter 2 and chapter 7. Four kingdoms. In between those two sections, you have Daniel's chapter 3 and chapter 6, and we all know the stories in those two chapters, right? There's a fiery furnace and there's a lion's den. Both of those two have a similar experience. How to be resolute in the midst of overwhelming circumstances. That's the example we have in those two. So they stay in parallel. And in between there, we have two other chapters. And they tell the story of two arrogant kings. The first one, King Nebuchadnezzar. We'll learn more about his arrogance today. And the other one, his son. And one of them is brought to humility in his pride. The other is not. And so what we have is this wonderful little section there of chapters 2 through 7 that have an overarching theme about kingdoms. How to live in the midst of these kingdoms. What God does with all the leaders of these kingdoms and then right in the dead center is a tremendous testimony from King Nebuchadnezzar. We'll get there when we get to chapter 4. About who the real Lord of the universe actually is. Now I wanted to take pains to tell you that because it's actually important to the interpretation of the rest of our passage today. And what we're going to deal with. Chapter 2 though is what the focus is about today. And that's really about a distressing dream that King Nebuchadnezzar has. And it begs explanation. I wonder, though, when we talk about dreams, if you, we realize just how prominent a theme interpreting visions and dreams are throughout our Bibles from the beginning to the end. If I can go all the way to the beginning of the Bible, we have Abraham receiving visions from God. If I go all the way to the end of my Bible, the entire book of Revelation is about visions and dreams of the Apostle John on the island of Patmos. And in between, we have stories like Jacob and his interpretation of the dreams of Pharaoh at the end of the book of Genesis. If we go to, well, Joseph, sorry. Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Gideon, Samuel, David and Solomon, the kings. The Christmas story itself encased with visions and dreams. The day of Pentecost, the giving of the Holy Spirit, Peter and Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 and 11. All of these stories and so many more are about the interpretation of dreams. God speaks through dreams and visions, and he still does it today. You know, when I was on staff with InterVarsity Christian Fellowship in Milwaukee, we did international ministry at a number of different universities, and I once was introduced to a Muslim couple that came to the United States from the country of Iran. They knew nothing about God while they were there, had no access to the Bible, but it was through the experience of vivid dreams that they had which led them to know about God's Son. And eventually that drew them out of their country and to come here for education and to seek more understanding of who Jesus was. In fact, missionaries tell stories like this all the time in the Muslim world. God is using dreams and visions to call forth people to know him. In this passage alone, phrases about the interpretation of dreams are used over 30 times. And what is this dream about ultimately? The interpretation of this dream in Daniel 2 provides a vision for the future. In the face of so much cynicism and lack of hope the exiles may have experienced, and the, in the face of the cynicism and lack of hope that we have each day that we look at the news, what our world needs right now is a dream of the future, a secure hope to cling to. Now, this is a long, long passage, as I said before to read for a sermon, so I'm not going to read all of it to you, but I am strongly encouraging you as a pastor that you would read it on your own. I had a great testimony last service of a person who came up to me and said that they had not been reading their Bible, but because I had asked them to do so, they've been reading the chapters in Daniel before they get here, and it has tremendously helped him. 
I want to encourage you to do the same. I'm going to do, instead summarize the story in five parts, and I'd like you to look at your bulletin in order to follow along those five parts. I will only read choice selections from Daniel chapter 2. So please follow along in the outline. Again, we have a drama which is roughly in five parts, and that first act I would call in verses 1 through 13, distress. Shakespeare was right, uneasy lies the head that wears the crown. Our story begins with a king being distressed about a troubling dream. He demands that his pagan advisors, described here as sorcerers, enchanters, magicians, astrologers, to explain the meaning of his dream to them, but he won't give them any details about the dream itself. Hey, I had a terrible dream in which I want you to explain it to me, but I'm not going to tell you a thing about it. So they don't even know what the dream was even about or any of the details in it, and they're expected to interpret it. And his pagan advisors, as you can imagine, after stalling for time, <laughs> basically tell him, we can't help you. We've never heard of a king asking for such a thing before. And wham! This immediately issues forth with King Nebuchadnezzar and his anger, declaring that he wants all of those advisors killed. Can you imagine that? Nebuchadnezzar, like many men in history who find themselves in all powerful positions over the most powerful empire or nation in the world, was notoriously temperamental and unpredictable. And by wanting to kill all of his advisors, he was creating his own sort of government shutdown. Seriously, though, the first act here creates the fundamental tension in our story. And it depicts Babylon as a place of fear, of hopelessness, and brutality. Things look gloomy, but we know the story doesn't end there. That's just the beginning. When tyrants suffer from bad dreams... God is at work. Nebuchadnezzar doesn't know it just yet, but his dream is actually depicting God's plan for the world. And that leads us to the second act, which I've described as disgrace. Our story continues when the chief executioner goes out to act on the orders of his king and to put to death all of the king's wise men and advisors. Daniel boldly speaks forth to the executioner and asks him why. And Eric, the executioner, tells him the story, and Daniel returns to his friends and does what? He prays, and he asks for mercy. And in the night, the mystery of the king's dream was revealed to him, and he thanks God. And I'd like to read that part of the thanksgiving that he gives in his doxology in verses 20 through 23. Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and he sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those that want understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. Listen to this. He knows what is in the darkness. And the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and might, and have now made known to me what we asked of you, for you have made known to us the king's matter. Daniel praises God for his sovereignty, and he gives us, he gave the exiles at the time, a new perspective. He says, remember that it is God that changes the seasons and removes kings. When God's people today face a crisis just like the exiles then, they need to follow the example of Daniel and his friends and take the matter to the Lord in prayer. Well, our story continues in the third act in verses 24 through 35, and I call this disclosure. Daniel tells the executioner not to carry out the king's demand to kill all the wise men because he can explain the dream. So the executioner immediately takes him to King Nebuchadnezzar, and Daniel is able to relate to the king what he dreamed about. What was it that King Nebuchadnezzar dreamt about? His dream 
is it about an enormous, dazzling statue of a human figure. We'll put an image of that up there for you. The head was of gold, the chest and arms silver, the belly and thighs bronze, the legs of iron and the feet of iron, a mixture of iron and clay. That's where we get the phrase, feet of clay. And in the king's dream, a rock is then cut out and strikes the feet of clay, breaking it to pieces that crumble and the whole statue falls apart and blows away like chaff in the wind. But the rock itself, on the other hand, grows and grows and grows till it becomes an enormous mountain. The rock is here to stay. Okay, now that's some wild dream. <laughs> it's one thing to know what the dream was about. It's another thing to interpret it. And that brings us to the fourth act in verses 36 through 45. Display. It is God's display of power that gives Daniel the means to interpret that dream. He tells Nebuchadnezzar that he, the king, is the head of gold. Then an inferior kingdom will come up or rise up after him that is of silver, a third one of bronze, and lastly one of iron with feet partly strong and partly brittle. And he closes with these words in verses 44 and 45. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. Nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it itself will endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain. Not a rock that was made by human hands, a rock that broke the iron, the, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold into pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. And that leads us to the final part, the final act that we have, fifthly and lastly, verses 46 through 49, distinguish. Because Daniel is lauded, the king responds to what God has revealed by literally worshiping him. He falls at Daniel's feet, prostate, and pays him honor placing Daniel and his friends in the highest position of authority in his entire kingdom. And now stepping away from our story, we know today Daniel to be forever associated with the gift and embodiment of wisdom itself. His testimony expressed the superiority of God's wisdom over and above all the pagan pantheon of Babylonian gods. Okay, got it? That's the story of chapter two, five acts. We have a giant statue made of all kinds of metals and a giant growing rock. And Daniel is explaining to King Nebuchadnezzar that what he was seeing is successive kingdoms in the future from his time going forward. Now, believe it or not, commentators will disagree on millions of things, but on this, most of them agree. Commentators actually agree on what this, these successive kingdoms refer to for the most part. Let me go through those and we'll put them up on the screen for you. The head of gold is clearly about King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian Empire because Daniel said so. No argument there. What comes after that is the chest and the arms of silver... Those most likely represent the Persian Empire that followed after the Babylonians. Most specifically, King Darius, who rose up after the Babylonians and took them over. And then what comes after that is the belly and the thighs of brass. That most likely represents Hellenistic Greece. Alexander the Great, who would sweep over all of that land and, and create a gigantic empire. Did you know a lot of your Bible talks about Alexander the Great? I bet many of you don't know that. And then after Alexander, we have the legs of iron and the feet of clay. Now that's where some commentators disagree, but we know that they are the successors to Alexander, and most of them believe it to be Rome, and we have hints that that's how Jesus himself understood it when we get to Luke chapter 21. So that's the statue, successive 
kingdoms in history, great empires. But what about the rock? What is that all about? Well, the rock or the stone is a frequent image of God in Scripture and especially of God's Messiah, the Christ. The stone that makes men stumble and the rock that makes them fall. There's countless references to that in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Jesus applied those to himself. The destruction of the statue by the stone represented the coming of Jesus Christ. The rock that was here to stay. Who would judge his enemies and establish his universal kingdom. And this vision tells the exiles and it tells us that all other kingdoms, no matter how powerful that they are, they, they are in the end passing through history and they will crumble. Human enterprises decline as time goes on, but not the kingdom of God. By the way, when you come to the beginning of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in your New Testament, and Jesus comes onto the scene, what do they announce? They announce the kingdom of God is near. It has arrived. Do you see how this connects the dots? The kingdom of God is what this passage is about. Is it appropriate for me to say that the rock is Jesus? Where do I get this idea from the text in Daniel? Well, I think we can say that it is explicitly about Jesus, even by Daniel's own words. I told you there was a parallel between chapter 2 and chapter 7. If you slip over to chapter 7, which I'd like you to do right now, and look at verses 13 and 14, he's again talking about the four kingdoms. But instead of talking about a statue, he's talking about four beasts. But it's four kingdoms. They're representing the same kingdoms. And what does he say in verses 13 and 14? In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man. By the way, what was Jesus' most common self-reference? Son of man. What does it say about the son of man? Coming with the clouds of heaven, he approached the ancient of days and he was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. You know that the book of Revelation borrows all of this in chapter 7, right? Every nation, tribe, tongue, right? Speaking of Jesus, his dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Look again in verses 44 through 45, and you will see the same thing. Very obviously, this whole story is about the coming of the Messiah, of Jesus' son. And this is meant to give hope to the exiled Jews as it should give hope to us too. Even if it doesn't seem that way at the time, even when times are difficult, even when we experience war and we see great difficulties playing themselves out on the world scene and all over our news, God is ultimately in control of all of history. Not false gods, not astrologers, not magicians, not enchanters, God. And that leads me to an important digression. More and more young people are being drawn to the trappings of paganism in our culture. Just ask the folks who work at our fine teen center how many of them do not know God at all, have no background in who God is, and are playing around with pagan things. Maybe it's because we love mysteries or the occult. Here, these pagan things are described as sorcery and enchanting and astrology and magic, but we have our own versions today. On Yale's university campus, there is a plaque that reads this, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. How many know where that's from? Several of you know that's in John chapter 8, verse 31. Did you notice what it leaves out? It leaves out the context of that verse, which says this, John chapter 8, verses 30 and 31, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. 
You see, the pagan agenda is all about removing God from that context. It is about exaggerating and glorifying human understanding independent of God. If any of you have ever been to Yale before, there is a rare bookstore there, in a, and they have a sunken garden, which is designed to simulate our universe. Let me tell you about it. We got a picture of it that will come up. A large marble pyramid symbolizes time. A donut-shaped structure emphasizes the never-ending aspects of energy, and a huge die perched on the, its tip signifies chance. This is the worldview of modern humanity, a self-existing universe, a cosmos consisting of energy, time, and chance. And those Babylonian advisors who are, are sitting before King Nebuchadnezzar, who's demanding that they interpret his dream, they don't know which way the die will be cast because chance is opaque. It is nothing. In fact, chance is not a mechanism for anything. It is the lack of explanation for something. If you're a Bible-believing Christian, then you'll recognize that what the Yale Garden demonstrates and shows to us is in the end a lie. Like Daniel, we hold that there is a God who stands outside of all of those things and knows in one sense orders the course of history through the rise and rubble of kingdoms until the day that he sets up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed through his son. So in summary, pagan practices are attempts to fool around with things we don't understand in the dark in order to control or in some cases predict our future. Are you with me? And there are countless people messing around with this today because they don't know God. So it's important we take them to Daniel 2, which is an opus to the futility of paganism. Let's look at verses 10 and 11. They are a confession of the failure of the pagan ways. When asked to interpret the king's dreams, the astrologers answer the king and is condemning of themselves. Listen to this. There is no one on earth who can do what the king asks. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician, enchanter, or astrologer. What the king asks is too difficult. Because no one can reveal it to the king except the gods. And they do not live among humans. Well, maybe the Babylonian gods don't. But there is a God who would dwell among humans, who would incarnate flesh, who came at our Christmas and dwell among us and live an impeccable and perfect life and die in our place, identifying with all of our suffering, dealing death a death blow and rising once again. So the statement of the advisors in this text wipes out astrology and other forms of human prophecy. Don't mess with that stuff, friends. By their own admission, it cannot help them when Nebuchadnezzar demands an interpretation of his dream. It has failed them when they needed it most. And that's what I mean by the futility of paganism. It's just darkness in the end. You know, throughout Bible history, you'll find occasions when God exposed the foolishness of the world and its deceptiveness. If I were to trace that theme in Scripture, we would be reminded of Moses and Aaron defeating the magicians of Pharaoh and the gods of Egypt, right? We might be reminded of Elijah on Mount Carmel who exposed the deception of Baal and Ashtoreth. Or Jeremiah confronting the false prophet and revealing their wickedness. Or Paul exposing the deception of Bar-Jesus the sorcerer in Acts chapter 13. But it was Jesus, by his life, teaching and sacrificial death, that declared that the wisdom of this world is merely foolishness with God. And that includes all of its pagan myths and its false religions. Don't be caught up in those things 
Daniel reinforces this truth in verse 27. He says this, No wise man, no enchanter, no magician, no diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. He could stop right there, but he doesn't. Listen to what he says next. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. You see, the pagan enterprise is helpless in the face of the king's demands, and it is ultimately bound for disappointment if you play around with it today. Why? Because it can give no perspective and no word from outside of its own experience. It is driven, as this text says, by fear and darkened by ignorance. By contrast, God knows what is in the darkness. And I want you to hear this. Life is a dead-end street without a God who discloses our future. He is telling the Jews through this story that there's nothing to be awed about by being stuck in Babylon, being amongst their pagan powers and empires, despite all of its trappings, and all of its followers, don't get caught up in those things. For in the end, it is nothing but emptiness and darkness. The only sure hope can come because God has interrupted and spoken into it and disclosed himself. He is breaking into our world. If you are without hope, if you are lost, you should go to the one who can break in and speak to that and reveal himself. And this is a truth we need to cling to in an increasingly faithless culture. So what this chapter is really about is a theology of hope, right? How to be faithful in a faithless world. And hope, at least in this case, actually turned out to be the only hope for the astrologers and all the wise men of Babylon. Because if Daniel had not interpreted their dream, they all would have been dead. So even though they don't even know it, God was their only hope too. If you've messed around with paganism and you've been lost in that, God is your only hope. Don't seek wisdom in pagan practices. Don't pretend it will help you with your future. That's the wrong place to go. Approach the only source for a lasting future. Do as Daniel did and pray. I'd like to reread the, the passage of scripture that I had before as a closing prayer, and I'd like you to hear this. This is verses 20 through 23. Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and might and have now made known to me what we asked of you. Only God can give us a future. And of his kingdom, the rock is here to stay. What starts out small grows and becomes a mountain. And the image of the mountain signifies the mount of the Lord's temple in the book of Isaiah that will once again be glorified among the nations. And while Daniel himself would not see it in his life, he had a steadfast hope. Near the end of his life, the exiles and the people would return to build it, and one day, Jesus himself would come to be the true temple. And mystery of mysteries, he would build it within our hearts one day. We thank you, Lord, and we give you praise. Would you cause us to seek you in the darkness, no matter what our times are declaring to us, no matter how desperate they may be, would you cause us to walk with you? Would you give us a future because the future only lies in you? We pray it in the name of Jesus Christ, the rock that is here to stay. Let's worship.